And now we welcome Snoqualmie Mayor Matt Larson to present his State of the City for the Snow Valley Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Earl. Uh, let me first thank the Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity. Now, as many of you recall, at last year's State of the City address, it was not an exaggeration for me to say that the city was in the strongest position it's been in probably the entire history of the city. Uh, after about a decade and a half's worth of work with the city council, uh, we were really in a good position to, to hit, uh, our goal was to be in a strong, fiscally sustainable position as we were approaching the build out of Snoqualmie Ridge when all the revenues would drop out. So uh, suffice it to say we were, we were in a very good position. But it's amazing how fast things can un unravel in just a matter of three months. The fourth quarter of 2019 was not a very good quarter for us. A number of things started to unravel very quickly. Uh, and just when we thought it couldn't get much worse as we went into 2020, this guy, uh, the ugly showed up uh, with the COVID crisis. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I know folks are eager to hear about the COVID crisis, but it's important to reset where we were at the end of 2019 so uh, folks can understand the difference between our, or the true impacts of the COVID crisis versus where we were at that time. And uh, I'm gonna start focusing on those two pieces and then end on a more hopefully hopeful or optimistic note uh, with the good. So in October of 2019, we got the news that the Salish expansion project was being purchased and then canceled. This was a significant hit for something we've been working on for over a decade. Uh, in order to achieve that sustainable budget I spoke about, uh, this lost, we, we lost $750,000 of anticipated revenue that $750,000 of reoccurring revenue that we would uh, re get every year into the future. In fact, it would grow from there. We also lost $130,000 from a payment in lieu of tax related to the existing Salish Lodge. Uh, that one's a bit complicated to explain, but suffice it to say the Muckleshoot tribes had a property tax exemption and they paid this in lieu of that. The Snoqualmies have not yet applied for that exemption, so there is a chance that that may eventually come back to us but for now uh, we've lost it. Uh, in November then, the next month, the Washington State voters voted in favor of the Initiative 976 car tab funding or basically to, to reduce car tabs to $30. That's pending in court, but at this point we've lost $200,000 of recurring revenue that goes toward taking care of our streets. And then in, in uh, December, at the conclusion of our budget process, for the first time since 2001, the council chose, chose not to exercise its right to do do a 1% uh, property tax increase or the maximum allowed by law. And that lost another $89,000 of reoccurring annual revenue going into the future. Now that may, that may not seem like a big number, but, I, you know, but I'm gonna come back to that to explain why that issue on um, inflationary increases is, is a big issue for cities across the state of Washington. Since 2001, it's really changed a lot of the behaviors of city councils and administrations. And of course, the, the old, old other imminent threat that we've been paying attention to for some time is this is really the year where we hit the full build out of Snoqualmie Ridge. In addition to the operational impacts, we did also get impacted by some capital changes on ca capital revenues. Uh, the community center, it was aside from the new expanded component part of the community center, we did not count of, account for the, the cost of a 10 foot retaining wall going down the center of the structure and also for the cost of remodeling the existing facility that were added to the cost of the new. So there's cost estimates that in that same time frame went up by over $3 million. Uh, the park we overlay with, the, again, the loss of the I-976 revenues at the state, the idea of getting matching grants to uh, address the parkway became far more remote. And so it, it needs immediate attention. So we are, we're anticipating on a six and a half million dollar project of having to put considerably more money into that. And then of course there was the loss of revenues of one-time capital revenue on the sales expansion to 2 million and with um, the potential to do a temporary card tap fee for two years for a $400,000 loss to backfill the cost of that. Uh, altogether between increased costs and loss of revenue, that amounted to about a, almost a $10 million swing in available resources. So this is where we found ourselves. I, I mean, for many years, I talked about a fiscal cliff that we were you know, working to close, uh, again, to get to a sustainable point at the build out of Suquamay Ridge. But with the events that happened in the fourth quarter of 2019, we now have a new fiscal cliff that's opened up again. And uh, although we, at that time we seemed to be fine this year, we were looking at a $700,000 gap next year, a $1 million gap afterward and so forth. And, and so forth. And um, suddenly we were in a very new normal and having to roll up our sleeves and go back to the drawing board to, uh, to address this crisis. 
Now, I want to take a moment to go back and, and uh, speak about that 1% issue. Uh, property tax levies and how they work can be very confusing, and there's a lot of confusion in the public about that. Uh, so what I've done is I've, I've uh, invented the fictitious town of Cinco Casas, or five homes. And let's presume for a moment that all the houses in, you know, five houses in Cinco Casas are all the same value. They're all $100,000 a piece. And when you add up the total value of all the homes, you get the city's assessed valuation, which is what the King County Assessor concerns them with itself with. Because, with, uh, because if the city of um, Cinco Casas is collecting, has been collecting $5,000 in total property tax revenue, what the uh, tax assessor does is takes, takes that $5,000, divides by how many units. So in this case, there's 500 units of 1,000 for the overall uh, AV value for the city, divides it by those 500 units to get the levy rate of $10 per thousand goes back to each household in the community and multiplies. So for, for example, the, the house at the top is worth 100 units of 1,000, 100 times 10 equals $1,000. And you add up all those taxes collected and the city collects $5,000. Now the question I often get is, Mayor, are my property value went sky high. What are you doing with all the extra revenue? So let's presume that Cinco Casas property values have doubled on all the houses in the course of a year. So we now have a new AV value for the city of a million dollars. That's a thousand units of a thousand. Again, the tax assessor takes that new valuation, takes the amount the city's collected, there's no increase, divides it by the new AV value of a thousand units and gets a new levy rate of $5. Multiplies again, so for example, the, the first house is 200 units of a thousand times $5 equals a thousand dollars. And again, although the valuation has changed quite a bit, the city still only gets $5,000. There has been no increase whatsoever, even though the market varies considerably. The question I also get is if there's been no other tax, voted tax increases or anything else going on in the city, we explain that mechanism and people say, yeah, but my taxes still went up, Mayor, why is that? Well, in this case, let's assume the two houses at the top had a new community center and pool built next to them and their valuation went up by 50% but the two houses at the bottom had a sewer plant expansion built next to them and their property values plummeted in half. The valuation for the city, however, is still a half a million dollars or 500 units of a thousand. City's still collecting $5,000. Tax assessor takes the 5,000, divides it by the 500 units, and again, gets a levy rate of $10, multiplies that by each home. And you can see the factor here is if your property or a commercial or residential property in the city is, is uh, improving in value higher than the normal, then you'll likely see an increase. However, if your value or property is dropping lower than the average, then you're going to see, actually see a decrease in your taxes. So this disparity here is more internal with the homes. It has no impact on what the city's collecting, even though there can be a variation here in property appraisals, uh, the city can only still collect only $5,000. Now let's assume the Cinco Casa City Council has now determined to increase the maximum allowed by state law, 1% their property tax revenues. They can take the $5,000 pot, increase it by 1% to 5,050. Again, the valuation of the town is still a half a million dollars. Take the 5,050, the new amount needed and divide it by the, the uh, appraised uh, assessed valuation for the entire city and a new levy rate of $10.10 pops out multiply that against those same homes and you can see the houses whose values went up higher are paying $15 more per year to cover that 1%. The average house is paying $10 more and those of whose property values have gone down are still paying more but only $5. The city is now collecting $5,050. Now in Snoqualmie's case, uh, we are uh, highly dependent on property taxes. It's one of the biggest portions of our budget at 42% of our budget that re represents $8 million of our budget. So if we take that $8 million and then um, put it on a chart here, you can see that in 2020, we're starting at the $8 million. Now, if the revenues never grow and the city council never approved its maximum 1% increase, that revenue would stay flatlined into the subsequent years or future. If the council, uh, but the problem is, we're, although revenues stay flatlined, the expenses are not flat. We are experiencing on any given year due to salary and wage and benefit, healthcare benefits, um, supplies, materials, contracts, and an inflationary cost factor of at least 3% per year. 
So 3% of $8 million represents $240,000 of inflationary cost every year against that amount of the budget. So we're essentially, um, we, we can't continue to deliver the same levels of service that the community enjoys at that same cost because the costs are going up and yet the revenues are remaining flat. So we have to find out a way to find new revenue to the tune of quarter million dollars a year uh, in order to keep up with that cost of doing business just to maintain service levels. So the city council can mitigate that in part if it approves the 1%, which represents $80,000 uh, and reduce that to 160,000, but at least we still have to pursue additional revenues to backfill that $160,000 loss annually. And as you can see that, that loss compounds over the years, uh, if the council never took the 1%, it would compound to a $1.6 million loss after six years that's no longer being, or no, not being collected, uh, or a 1.1 million if the 1% was exercised. So the council, every council only has three, three you know, tools in its toolboxes that it can find more revenues. Uh, one is economic development. Uh, in this case, however, with the loss of the sales expansion, we didn't move forward, we moved actually backward. We didn't gain more revenue to keep up with that level of service and the, and the rising cost we actually lost ground. So it's it it kind of double compounded. At the, same, uh, at the same time, when you looked at raising taxes or fees to find new revenue, we didn't gain ground. We actually lost ground with the I passage of I-976 and with the uh, no 1% increase in the property taxes. So that only leaves one bucket to really go to, and that's the levels of service. And I'll come back to that more in a, in a moment. You'll notice in the middle um, where these come together, you'll, you'll hear many people that might be running for office that say, say as part of their campaign speech, hey, hey, vote for me. I'm gonna uh, improve our lousy levels of service. I'm gonna stop uh, growth and development and I'm gonna keep these, these guys from raising your taxes and fees. That's considered no action on all these fronts. And frankly, that's utopia. And utopia in Greek means nowhere. Uh, that's a, that's a, a fantasy. You simply can't run business that way. And frankly, I would ask if anybody um, is running for office and you hear that theme from them, uh, please realize they're not a politician, they're, they're a magician. So as I stated before, uh, this is the state we were at when come uh, Patrick, St. Patrick's Day of, of March 2020, this guy showed up, or Mr. Ugly showed up, and um, we've had a lot of impacts, of course, to all these taxing sources, which I'll go through. The one I won't come back in detail is the non-utility capital projects. We were, after the fourth quarter 2019 anticipated a 24 percent cut in our non-utility capital projects of which there's about 27. Uh, mostly we were doing deferrals or pushing them off to later years and we were bringing that back to council in fact this Monday night and decided to pull that from the council because now we have to go back on a second pass and make further adjustments given the COVID impacts. So again I'll go into more detail here. So starting with the sales and B&O tax uh, we were projecting a, and we combine these because they tend to track each other and the B&O B &O tax is a much smaller margin of that. But we were anticipating a 17% drop just in this year in retail and B&O tax revenues. Although that's a bit misleading because we uh, factored in, uh, there are a lot of the sales have shifted to online sales and have maintained that revenue for the city. Or, or uh, since we don't have a lot of retail base, this Safeway can be a significant portion of that and they've actually probably improved or increased their sales and not diminished. So if we take some of those components out of it, we're anticipating as much as a 75% drop in our, in our brick and mortar small businesses in town, uh, something that would, would continue to be even a 50% drop into the summer and about a 33% into the fall. On the lodging tax money, this, is comes, this is money derived from hotels and, and the hospitality industry. We're anticipating a 33% drop just this year alone and a 30% drop going into 2021. Again, this is a little misleading because there were revenues owed in 2019 that ended up getting counted in 2020. So if those were taken out, this drop in 2020 would probably go to a 50% or more. This one on real estate excise tax is a little more controversial because we're seeing such mixed news out there about what's happening to the commercial and real estate market. Some very positive, some very negative. So we're taking a little bit more of a conservative course at this point, anticipating about a, a 46% 6 drop in REIT uh, in this year and 42% going into 2021. The one reason why you see a big drop from 2019 of $500,000 is that was due just to the salish purchase alone that uh, was a real estate excise tax connected with that purchase. 
On utility tax, this is a, a very typically a very stable revenue source because it's a tax basically on your cell phone, on your cable, on your city utilities, water, sewer, and storm. Uh, but in this case, we're being a little conservative and already seeing and anticipating some loss of revenues there. Again, fairly modest. If you look at the numbers, about a drop of about uh, $200,000 out of 2.7 million, uh, 7% in 2011, and 21. The reason for this anticipated drop is because we there's a number of people whose payments have been deferred or we're anticipating will maybe never make those utility payments as they're trying to, to recover from the COVID crisis. Uh, for the gas tax, this is a relatively small amount of money. We're seeing about a 10% drop right now. And so this is as compared, you can see the, the top line here, the brown line is the expenses. Uh, the middle line there is the bad Q14, 19. In other words, that really bad place we were at at the end of Q4 in 2019. But you can see then we add the revenue drops from the ugly post COVID period. And this problem becomes even more severe. And the big notable difference was that uh, you can see the the drop in 2020, uh, whereas, whereas we didn't have a crisis facing us in 2020 so much uh, after the fourth quarter in 2019, we're now seeing up to a, over $1 million drop in revenues or a gap, a deficit just in this year alone going into uh, 2021. I think it's very important to note that um, we this is a one-time sort of crisis in a, in a like a recession era. So we we would see the immediate addressal of some of those gaps in 20 uh, through some rainy day reserves for which they're specifically designed. So now that you've seen that uh, very gloomy bad news, uh, I wanna talk about some what we see as some of the more op hopeful or op opportunities and assets, the assets of our communities and opportunities ahead in community. And, I want, and I'm gonna spend the, uh, much of the rest, the remainder of my presentation really focusing on these three areas. So in terms of assets, one of the things um, really going our way is the demographics of the community. We, we have, we're much, much higher, more educated population than the average and a much higher per capita income than the average community. And so what's, uh, that reflects that we're mostly a white collar management group, many, many folks of which were able to pivot and work remotely from home. Uh, and so we don't have a large uh, blue collar or hourly um, tax or, or, or number of residents that are hourly workers. And so we're not seeing as much suffering in our community on an individual basis as the, uh, we see in other communities around the region. Uh, secondary, as I'm, I kind of noted before, we uh, are fortunate to have the majority of our budget in excess of 60% be very, very stable tax revenue sources like the property taxes. You can see from the way I described how the levy works, even if the market can be very volatile, the actual revenues uh, can be quite stable and the same for utility taxes as well. The, um, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, so we also had the, the advantage of on the, um, the construction front, three major projects never had a hiccup or pause in construction due to the fact that they were essential services. The Church on the Ridge provides a lot of human services through uh, their helping hands, food bank and other uh, rental assistance and other mental, mental health counseling and so forth that they offer to the community. Uh, the Panorama Apartments is an affordable housing project continued as well as the Performing Heart Center with the high school as being part of essential education resources. So that was good news for us. Uh, the hockey arena took a bit of a hit for about a month and a half, but we were, did all we could with, to get them back online as early as possible. Uh, they and our, are back underway. These, the Boulder building fortunately was almost at completion when the COVID crisis hit, so they never had much of an impact. The Spring Plaza continued to take more impacts, but again, they're, they're underway as well at this time. So I now want to pivot to the opportunities the council has. It's, this is essentially, as I mentioned before, the, the council toolbox or the tools they can use to address that, that, that scary deficit that we've now been confronted with rather quickly here. And I'm going to go into each of these buckets, so to speak, and I've color coded them hopefully so it's easier to kind of track when I'm talking about each one. And there's in, in, the, in the bucket of economic development, I'm just going to address three projects on the horizon, the mill site, Parcel S21 in the business park, a potential business park expansion, again, that could provide additional revenues or new revenues that can address the deficit that we're facing. So on the mill side, as you know, this is a, one that we're trying to orientate toward winery tourism. Again, to get some dollars from a lot of those visitors or 1.8 to 2 million visitors to come to Snoqualmie Falls, keep them in town a little longer so they leave some money in town. The, um, a very kind of walkable retail center with restaurants and shops and a little amphitheater and so forth. 
Uh, this represents about 600,000 square feet of retail and commercial development, 510 jobs connected with that, and 160 units of uh, work market rate of workforce housing, and 15% uh, of that of which would be uh, affordable. And then you can see here, just quickly on that bottom blue line on the box, the totals, we're anticipating revenues, primarily starting with development revenues of a quarter million dollars into 2021, growing upwards of $1.5 uh, $1 million at the full build out of that project. So if we put that on the graph with, again, against this deficit, you can see that green dashed line in the middle represents the revenue coming from the uh, mill site development and could do a considerable amount to mitigate that uh, fiscal cliff. Parcel S21 is a small last remaining undeveloped parcel on Snoqualmie Ridge right adjacent to the hospital out by the SR18990 interchange. It's a fairly small project. We anticipate some development maybe the next year or two uh, that could bring in another two or three hundred thousand dollars of ongoing revenue. Uh, there's potential in our urban growth area just to the east of the current business park in Snoqualmie Ridge to do some development here. Uh, that would represent you know some considerable revenue but unfortunately it's, it's probably a bit down the road not until 2024 so it doesn't give us any immediate relief but it's something we think would be wise to at least get in motion given the time it takes to get these projects moving and again that would be depending on what the council chooses. Now shifting to the, the brownish circle, our levels of service, uh, we, when, when I was coming out of the, when we were coming out of the fourth quarter of 2019, I think we were of the, the, the thinking that we could address a lot of the, these deficits still without doing any significant service cuts, but I just don't see how that's possible at this point. So there has to be some consolidations. So on the very short term, uh, we're looking at probably having to entertain uh, compensation freezes through 20 or 22, 21, 22, or even addressing that with um, the council and the, the, the city unions to see if there wouldn't be some possible concessions for even the remainder of 2020. Uh, we would also execute a hiring freeze, not filling some current vacant positions, and then follow up with staff consolidations. And what I mean by that, there's some positions we have like an events coordinator that's not gonna be do, doing too many events in the foreseeable future. So we would consolidate some of the existing staff to backfill some of those vacancies to uh, cover those for the time being. And then travel and training reductions, uh, although I'd be, be reluctant to be very careful about doing those, particularly in police and fire areas, because those are perishable and necessary skills uh, to, to maintain in, in some of those areas. So with those kind of adjustments, we're anticipating at least at 400,000 to a half million dollars that we could, without doing real serious damage to the level of service, uh, probably eke out of the, that, that part of the bucket. And as you can see here, at least it again, eats into some of that deficit spending. Uh, the one note of caution I would say is that although our staff levels have remained fairly constant over the years, because the population growth and demands on services are increasing, even maintaining level staff levels at, a, at the same amount is almost the equivalent of, of laying off staff because if you need to add staff to meet that new demand, uh, then, then we're, we're basically building a shortfall. We were experiencing that, as you can see on this graph, the, the dark dash line um, measures how many full-time equivalent of employees do we have as compared to the per capita or, or for every thousand uh, uh, residents in the city. And if the population is growing and the staff levels are staying flat, then you can see that that line would tend to dip as you're seeing back in 2016 when we did a levied lid lift and, and were able through that to find revenues to hire uh, and two additional or police detectives and the firefighter. And that's why you see that FDE per thousand uh, grow up to 2018. But now that that's, that's starting to level off with continued growth, that's starting to drop again. So again, it's an it's a area for concern about not rushing into making staff cuts you might regret. Uh, the, also the area that would be a, a word of caution for the council and for the mayor or particularly elected officials is that before you make cuts, it would be best to turn and at least ask the community what they would prefer We've found over the years, going back to the fire station levy with 70% support, that there's generally been very strong support for a number of measures through those years. You can see just in the past year, in August, uh, every single precinct passed the King County Parks and Trails open space levy to the tune of 62%. And in November of the, uh, last year, 54% of our residents actually rejected Initiative 976 on the car tab fee. Uh, basically saying they were willing to continue to invest in our local infrastructure. 
And then, and then one last note of caution on levels of service. Right now, like most all other communities, we struggle with the problem of trying to keep up with that cost of doing business, just to sustain the current levels of service and keep up with inflation. That's a, a monumental challenge in itself, but we, we are the envy of many communities because that's been our primary challenge. What can happen when you let the service level slip backward is that you introduce a new major problem, and that is if you ever get to a point where you want to now try to restore your needed and appropriate staffing levels, uh, that's a huge challenge to accomplish on top of trying to continue to maintain every year uh, and sustain the service level. So now you've introduced uh, two problems that you will constantly struggle with. And, uh, and then of course, if you, you let the service levels deteriorate, the, the unfortunate result of that would be a, kind of an unvirtuous cycle where people feel like they're getting crappy services and when you ask them for tax increases to help rectify that, they say, well, no, because I get lousy services for my money and then you, lose, you start losing support in the community and it can really go sideways on you. Now, if the, as we talked about before, the 1% property tax uh, represents about a, you know, 80,000 growing up to half a million dollars over six, several years. Uh, so we've already talked about that. that. That could be a tool to, again, address the deficit. If we did a, uh, another tool, would, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I pivoted to the, um, the blue box or the, the, the blue bucket, which is the um, tax, taxes and fees. And one, one fee that we think is viable if we lose the $30 card tab fee, which isn't very popular, we do have the option to do a, a, a public voted two-tenths of 1% sales tax increase. Now, the benefit of that is uh, threefold. One is card tab fees are unpopular. Um, the two tenths would allow for every visitor that comes into town that purchases anything in town, they're now helping contribute to paying for our, our streets and so forth. And uh, right now we have an 8.6% sales tax rate, which is one of the lowest in the, in the King County. And even at 8.8%, we would still be on the lower side of many like, uh, summer communities around us. And so there's uh, some capacity there to do that. But you can see it represents upwards of a half a million to six hundred thousand dollars a year in new revenue to again address this deficit. And then, lastly, one tool is a levy lid lift. Um, you might recall that back in two thousand one, when Tim Iman pushed for the property tax uh, or for the for the cap on property taxes, he said, "Well, look, I'm not trying to stop. Councils can still raise taxes. They just have to do it. It would force councils to have to go even just to keep up with inflation. They have to go out to the public and ask for modest increases." Now, it simply doesn't make sense every year to come out and ask the public, can we increase taxes to keep up with inflation? Because if I'm looking for $160,000 in revenue and I'm spending $40,000 on an election cost, uh, that just isn't very wise use of money. So one strategy a council can employ is to commit to, a, on every three or four year cycle, to do a regular levy lid lift and communicate that to the community. To say, look, we'll just do an incremental step adjustment every year to just adjust for inflation to make sure our revenues are keeping up with inflation and we can keep those service levels where the community enjoys them. And oh, I'm sorry, again, you can see where that represents about a half million to $600,000 of, of new revenue to again address this, this gap. And then we get to, uh, the, then the council can have some fun now now that you've, they've seen all these different tools and uh, sit down and start to, to figure out how do you want to put the different puzzle pieces together in, in different fashions from those different buckets to address the, the, the problem before you. So uh, I'll color code those again, whether it's economic development levels of service and taxes and fees. And I'm just going to show three scenarios, possible scenarios of which could be uh, quite a number of them. So here's a, a mix of, again, the purple development mill site S21 mixed with a level of service mixed with a 1% annual property tax increase uh, and, and one-time revenue. One other thing that's already in these models is diverting for at least a year or so uh, revenues that would otherwise be considered one-time capital revenues that you can't build a budget on, diverting those to capital, but we're incorporating it into the ongoing operational budget to address the 2020 deficit uh, because it's a one-time crisis that we're dealing with and appropriate. The downside of that is it draws money away from what otherwise would go into capital funds which means we have to go back to some of those capital projects and revisit ones we can perhaps no longer afford to do in the, in the near future. The next scenario is a mill site S21, levels of service, property tax increase, and that two tenths of 1% sales tax. And you can see this combination of those tools darn near solves the challenge and problem before us. Uh, third option would be again, uh, a similar one, uh, 
mill site business park level, level of service, uh, 1% property tax and a 2% sales tax in addition to the one time being diverted. So lastly, I wanna conclude by recognizing that one of the other huge assets that's been very um, inspirational and lifts me up when I kind of get discouraged about these things has been the phenomenal assets we have in the community. We don't have a Department of Social and Health Services department, so we rely heavily on a number of partners in our community. Our Fire Chief, Mark Carrera, who is the Emergency Response Coordinator, help um, coordinate on a weekly basis. Every Monday, we get together and touch base with these all of these organizations and folks to make sure that they're um, aware of each other's resources and when they're tending to the needs of an individual family or individual, if they don't have a resource on hand, they have that relationship with another organization to send that or we're not duplicating efforts and so forth. Uh, I wanna put a particular shout out to uh, Love Snoqualmie Valley. They are an organization that, of, of which should be an umbrella for uh, governments, for nonprofits, for uh, human service organizations and so forth under that. If you go to their website, uh, but they're, they're, they're being um, supported right now by the Snoqualmie Valley Alliance Church, but they really want to service everybody and be that coordinating body or umbrella in which everybody can get coordinated. If you go to your website, you can see the Get Help, Give Help Community Resources page where all of us are kind of participating in making anybody that's looking for that rather than searching in 15 different places can go there as a clearinghouse to see, to either put a plea out for, hey, I need help, who can help me? Or to see where resources or someone who can provide services, see where the need is and connect those dots. So. A big shout out to them. Um, also want to note that the Snoqualmie Valley Hospital District, the school district, uh, uh, has also participated in that along with the Snoqualmie Ridge uh, Homeowners Association. School district's been providing lunches uh, for kids and families who can't afford those while school is, uh, is uh, locked down. Uh, the Ridge has been offering to put information for all of these organizations in its uh, newsletter that goes out to 90% of Snoqualmie residents. And uh, of course, the hospital with uh, frontline care workers is always greatly appreciated. And lastly, I just want to put a huge shout out to the leadership with the Chamber of Commerce. Kelly Coughlin has been working tirelessly. And uh, Earl Bell is the volunteer president and has put in an extraordinary amount of hour and time setting up biweekly Zoom means. It's been a profound resource for local businesses and a resource for uh, state and county representatives, Kathy Lambert and our state representatives to connect and have some immediate connection with um, what's happening on the ground with local businesses and take those stories directly back to the legislature, to the governor in those conversations. So people understand they've been a great partner working with the city on helping us allocate the working uh, nine, $10,000 working Washington grants that we hope to have news on soon. And as we're gearing up to next week, post the early next week to post uh, applications for the $410,000 of CARE Act community uh, corona relief funds that will be provided for uh, local small businesses or $10,000 grants for local small business and human service agencies. Uh, oh, it, well, and lastly, just put a big shout out from my city staff, uh, particularly like Fire Chief Mark Carrera, folks like Joan Pliego that have spent hours putting together all kinds of resources on our website for any, any uh, constituency group in the city to be able to go there to find access to resources. Um, uh, Nicole Weeby, our events coordinator, who again, we pivoted into helping the chamber, working with uh, Kelly at the chamber and, and all the folks. There's too many to name and I'm, and I'm fearful of missing someone, but just a, a big shout out. It's been again, very uplifting for me. So with that, I'm um, concluding by stating that, uh, that the current state of the city of Snoqualmie is good. Uh, there's certainly a bit of bad there and a whole lot of ugly. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I, I do see that there's an open it. I know Earl's gonna open it for questions and I'll, I'll take two quick questions um, that were in the, ch in the chat box. One was a question about early opening uh, for perhaps East King County, given that we're a much less densely populated area than East King County. Uh, two point, the timing of that question was perfect because just yesterday uh, we were having conversations with King County Councilmember Kathy Lambert proposing the idea that the mayor's in the rural communities east of the contiguous urban growth area, perhaps petition the governor to open early, or at least have a little little bit of uh, latitude there. Um, and so I'm, I'm enthusiastically on board that effort. The one um, caveat or downside that came out yesterday was that although our numbers of positive cases have been relatively flat up until now, we, we just noticed in the last three days, uh, three new cases of positive uh, in, in Snoqualmie. And so that, that gives a little bit of pause. I just got off the phone this afternoon with the, or I'm not the phone, but a Zoom meeting with the King County Executive. 
Uh, he, he is very much in his favor of the same philosophy has been addressed in that with the governor's office, but it has, it says at this point, it doesn't seem to be well received, but he'll continue to push on that front as well. So, and a second question that came in was about the, um, that there was a bit of controversy around a proposed amphitheater connected with the mill site development. And I guess my only caveat would be that uh, councils and mayors have to take controversy uh, kind of cautiously. There can be often a perceived controversy generated by um, some very well mobilized and, and a small minority of residents. I, I personally don't feel that most residents of Snoqualmie uh, you, you know, are opposed to the idea. I don't think it's appropriate at this very, very early point in that, that uh, development proposal to take that off the table. I know there's fears and concerns about an amphitheater as large as some, some have been saying 5,000 seat amphitheater. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. Maybe it's more appropriate to look at a two to 500 seat amphitheater, but I think that uh, that's an, uh, an amazing asset to consider for what we're trying to accomplish as a destination type retail area. So not quite to take it off the table. So again, Earl and Chamber of Commerce, thank you all very much. And thank, uh, thank you for anybody that's taking the time to uh, listen in.